So hello, welcome to this Transatlantic Poetry on Air broadcast. My name is Robert Peake, I'm the creator of this series. And tonight we'll be featuring poets from the Silk Road Review Issue 10 British Poetry Special Feature. This is a special feature that I edited as a way to expose more Americans to the wealth of British poetry uh, being written in the United Kingdom today. And one of the things I've loved about getting to know these poets and their work is hearing them read their work aloud. So this is an opportunity that um, that we can now share. If you're living outside the UK, you, you may not have been able to hear them, uh, hear these poets read their own work in their own voice, but tonight you can. So uh, the format for this evening, um, Katie Evans Bush and Claire Trivian will not be joining us. So we'll start with Isabel Gallimore and we'll end tonight with Paul Stevenson. Each of our four poets will be reading for about 10 minutes each. And uh, the good news is that we'll also be giving away prizes during the, during the broadcast. So uh, for those of you who are tuned in live, um, you have an opportunity to win a copy of uh, Silk Road Review issue number 10. Uh, this is the issue that contains the British Poetry Special Feature, uh, as well as 144 other pages of really interesting prose and poetry from all over the world. The way that you can win, uh, if you have a Twitter account, is to tweet a, a line from the poetry reading this evening that catches your attention. Uh, any line that, that grabs you from tonight's reading. Uh, and be sure to use the hashtag TA Poetry. TA as in transatlantic poetry. So hash sign TA Poetry. Um, that will, will get you entered to win. Uh, be nice also, of course, if you can attribute the quote to the author. Uh, bonus points if you can find their find their Twitter handle and, and do an at reply, but that's optional. So uh, at the end of the evening, I'll be um, reviewing the, the tweets of uh, Lines from Poems, and we'll be selecting some winners uh, to win a copy of Silk Road Review Issue 10, uh, where all of the poets you hear tonight uh, have been featured. So without any further ado, we'll get started with, with the reading. First poet this evening is Isabel Gallimore. Isabel was born in London. She earned a Master's of Literature in Poetry at the University of St. Andrews, and she's been published in Poetry Review, The Rialto, Poetry London, and anthologized in Entanglements, New Eco Poetry. Isabel was awarded a Hawthorne Fellowship in 2012, and she's currently researching environmental poetics and pedagogies for a PhD at the University of Exeter, uh, which has been funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Gives me great pleasure to welcome Isabel Gallimore. Isabel, are you there? Hi, I am. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, so it's lovely that Robert organized this. Thank you so much, Robert. And also to Silk Road Review for uh, publishing such an interesting collection of British poets. Um, I thought I'd end this evening with the Silk Road poem, but I'd begin with uh, a poem from the anthology that Robert just mentioned. Um, the anthology is called Entanglements, and it's really a book about, um, well, different poems, including Jory Graham, on environmental literature. Um, and this poem is called Harvest. Harvest. After stripping the branches of berries, the robin held a handful of seeds in its stomach. The robin carried a tree. In fact, it secretly sowed a whole forest, a store of bows and arrows and shields. Years found the bird had planted a battle. Its tiny body had borne the new king. Men looked up to the skies and blessed or blamed the planets moving overhead. A blackbird, meanwhile, started to pick at the fruit both armies had left. So my second poem this evening um, is about water, and that's unsurprising, seeing as Exeter is such a wet place to live at the moment. I think we've had sun maybe once or twice in the last couple of weeks, um, so there's quite a lot of watery poems going on this evening. This one is um, about a fact that I recently stumbled upon concerning very pure water, and the fact that often it will forget to freeze. So you can put a bottle of mineral water into the freezer, and when you think it's frozen, give it a nudge and it will still move as if, it's, if it's, as if it's water and only after a few seconds will it remember to freeze. The lake's fixation. A hushed, cold evening and some of the water is thinking again 
of the time it curled into a sunlit stone bath as a woman rinsed her sea anemone hair upon the other side of the world. The temperature shrinks quickly and the lake forgets to freeze. If something shakes or steps into it, such as these horses that race now from the burning barn, the water will stiffen, bite like a dog. So continuing the, the wet theme, um, a friend recently wants to do a project about holy wells in Cornwall. There are a lot of holy wells and they all have very different characters, all very interesting. He took me to a holy well in a place called St. Neots, which is in Cornwall um, near Bodmin, Bodmin Moor. This place, well, in fact, St. Neot is perhaps more interesting. He was only four foot tall. He was a very short man. And his well was special because an angel promised him that there would always be three fish in this well. He could eat one fish for dinner each night, and that fish would always be miraculously replaced the next morning. Holy well. Those seeking health. Those whose cells do not divide quickly enough, visit this tiny installation of blessed multiplications that an angel once promised. Two fish will be three fish by the next day, and always as long as you only eat one. There are no fish now, but where there's water, there's a weather of matter. See how the coins someone's placed in the ripple are becoming uncertain of their solid circles, copying their colour onto the granite floor until this well fills with the thoughts of halos. Barnacle. Barnacle, the author's intention, wears a little ivory hat. In the sea dark, he captains a solid idea from the depths. Other intentions cluster. A kind of rugby scrum occurs, and while each argues back and forth about what the ball represents, the rock they cover begins to move like a wave with a life of its own. Barnacle and friends become hitchhikers, but not one of them will notice until they reach warm angelfish waters or a blank coast where they'll lie beached. Sweet peas. When the fiddle starts up in the throat of the sparrow, they will take their places and bow to their partners. Skip four paces, hop left and turn right, and repeat until the pairs reunite. They'll soon appear woven with each other, yet love doesn't train them. They lead their lives as we do, mindful of climbing various ladders. Her hand holds his face. There she finds a new footing. So you may have realised from, from the poem so far that I'm, I'm a big fan of metaphor and of personification. I'll personify barnacles, sweet peas, and uh, bluebells. That's, that's the next poem. Um, the bluebell man is perhaps taking things a bit too far. I'm basically envisioning a kind of Lothario bluebell and I hope none of you will be put off bluebells for life. The bluebell man. His neck is at the angle of I'm so into you. This bluebell sitting at her table, his head dipping in and out of bashfulness, begins to blurt a coke and whiskey scent. By 10 o'clock, his face that was receptive as the skin behind her ears or under her breasts begins to shrivel. You're hot as the sun, he slurs, leering at her and shrugging off his denim suit to reveal a green bulge packed with tiny dreams of himself. The next poem is um, is after uh, something that Douglas Adams wrote in one of his essays. He mentioned that uh, young sloths will often forget that, um, or at least they'll mistake their own limbs for branches. Forest. One thing 
is liked by another. A leaf and a frog, a snake and a creeper. They try to complete each other's sentences. It's all about the flirts and rumour, for when one attempts to depend on the other, the sloth who took its own limb for a branch drops through the tangle of the forest canopy, holding only onto itself. And I'll finish this evening with the, um, the poem from Silk Road. Um, it's actually a version of a poem by um, a French writer called Francis Ponge. And he was a wonderful poet. He wrote these lovely prose poems that about soap. Um, what else did he write about? A lot, a lot about the seasons. And this one is conveniently about the end of the year. So I thought this evening it would be a good opportunity to read this one. The end of the year. It comes to nothing but cold tea. Leaves, grasses, the melted down trumpets of old daffodils steeped in rainwater. She's undressed in a strop. Is she waiting for someone to take this dirty laundry? There's no time for comedy. The weather can insist on four nights in one day. Two men walk the woods. Their feet make music of snogs or ribbits. Oh, and the ambiguity. Everything is soaked to the marrow. The melodramatic pheasant is soaked to his screech, but as if a great herbivore has turned, at least for the moment away, a bud pokes out one furry ear. Thank you very much for listening this evening. Thanks very much, Isabel. That was wonderful. So our, our next reader this evening is Chris McCabe. Chris McCabe was born in Liverpool, and he divides his time between Liverpool and London, but is joining us from Liverpool today. His work has been published in Manhattan Review, Magma, and Poetry Review. His play, Shad Thames Broken Wharf, was performed at the London Word Festival, and it's available from Penned in the Margins Press. His poetry collections are The Hutton Inquiry, Zeppelins, and most recently The Restructure, all of which are available from Salt Books. It's a wonderful reader, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Chris McCabe. Hi, Robert. Hello, everyone. I'm going to start my reading um, this evening with a poem that I wrote in collaboration with my son. Um, the poem I've got in Silk Road Review is uh, about my son's first day at school. And um, it took a little while to get to that point of, of heading him off to the safe hands of the teachers at school. And um, first of all, he had to teach me to become his dad. Um, so I wrote this poem with him when he was about one and a half. And I call it An Analogue Guide to Parenting. It's from this wonderful anthology called Adventures in Form. Lucky enough to have it published in there. And then what I did was um, my son, Pavel, he really liked to be held up to the clock at, the, at this point in his life. He was about 18 months old and he'd touch a number of the clock and would write it down. And I was becoming um, quite aware of the amount of um, kind of nonsensical parenting uh, quips, which I was um, trying to become a father, basically. Uh, to get some distance from that, I wrote down these words that I was saying, these sentences. I numbered them. And I held Pavel up to the clock, and every number that he touched corresponded with one of my lines, and that structured this poem. So this is really, um, this is really my um, kind of development as a parent. Day one. <clears throat> Why have you chewed the monkey? Don't push the lion in the post box. Careful on the pony with a full nappy. Why have you chewed the monkey? Don't get jam in the ridges. Why have you chewed the monkey? You've scrawled ink everywhere, now it's time for books. Now the bus is in the Hollandaise. I was trying to educate you then, but forget it. Now the bus is in the Hollandaise. We're not made of toast. Why have you chewed the monkey? Naughty boys don't go on swings. Don't push the lion in the post box. Why have you chewed the monkey? Why have you chewed the monkey? I was trying to educate you then, but forget it. You could only have your milk if you're going to sleep. You've scrawled ink everywhere, now it's time for books. Don't push the lion in the post box. Naughty boys don't go on swings. I was trying to educate you then, but forget it. You can only have your milk if you're going to sleep. Careful on the pony with a full nappy. 
the seven days of that. I'm not going to read all seven. Um, you get the you get the picture. And I'm going to read a kind of um, a series of poems around um, family. Um, some from my book, The Restructure, which Robert mentioned. Um, but I'm going to move on to the poem, which is from the Silk Road Review, issue ten, and it's um, it's called First Day at School. Very different kind of poem. I wrote it on the day that we we we, we took uh, Pavel to start school. It's very kind of um, strangely and surprisingly emotional day. <clears throat> it's written from his perspective. First day at school. I wake to know what Monday means. My new size is the one to grow into. The coat scuffs my throat. This bar of chocolate needs its own museum. I don't know the walk would be the walk we used for the nursery hours. The same beds hide behind their bibs and plastic bed masks. I can now go where I watch the older boy sling the hammer of his bag and scream. The railings are higher than circus fences. The playground has numbers in squares to help us count the play. I hope there's toy cutlery. I took the bolts from mine when I was three. The corridors and airport. The trophy cabinet up there is smaller than my dad's. Reception, the sign says, white on blue. Another woman in a crossword coat asks, how are you? Then how are you? A girl is crying, her face scrunched like the soft toys I washed in the days of the white hours of mama. There's a guitar in the window. Inside is a picture of a lorry that says, lorry. The train says, train. There is a pretend bus stop in there, my name, with a picture of a blue penguin. The new miss knew I like blue penguins. I want to sit with my friends in a circle. I need to take my hand from yours to cross my legs and sing. When I let go, stand by my name and watch. Listen to my voice rise with the class. And I was really interested in uh, Isabel's reading, where she brought in lots of uh, natural landscape, lots of Im imagery from from the natural world. And I'm going to read a few poems from from a collaborative book uh, that's just been published um, with a medical herbalist called Pharma Poetica. And um, it really interested me because she, the artist asked me to to write poems for labels, so I can just hold this up. I think you should be able to see the poems appear as labels on jars. So uh, it's got a, kind of an interesting, different way for me to present my poems. And um, the the artist, Maria Flotides, she asked me to write 10 poems about herbs. And uh, again, I, I kind of um, wrote, wrote them through the perspective of my son. We were in Cornwall. Again, it was a nice connection with Isabel's poems. And um, I was there for seven days, and I wrote these 10 poems during that time, um, really trying to trying to find the herbs and thinking of them through my um my son's kind of lower perspective down to the earth, if you like. So this one's called Hawthorne. There is no Hawthorne on these cliff tops. I want to soothe your heart even when the words aren't for you. I offer this antioxidant to your anxieties as a cardiac tonic for winter deliriums. My mind may blossom for the lovesick. Do you want to link me to death? We have, both of us, chronic heart failure. The rose that stabs you is your own organ. There are hawthorns, I'm told, in the new Hockney exhibition, but you have to pay to see them. Better the welcoming hedgerows in Regent's Park, though we'll never blossom, you know this, so far north of the river's black aneurysm. Rosemary, sea spray, my memory, sea dew, my eyes, there's a rosemary bed in the cave. When the boy answers back, I dress in black and hide with the mussels on the cliffs. I've been in dreams all day. I was dropped off early by a cuckoo. Boris Yeltsin died when she was pregnant. Now here come the reduced mares of London town. A socialist explodes in a pint glass. We remember, like pegging paper planes, employ miners to clean out the fish tank. The boy says, next time you see a circus, just knock it down. Sea spray, my memory, see you, my eyes. Daisy. 
Maybe Dada needs these for his poems, the boy says, and he picks three flecked pink. The insides like SM58 microphones, yellow, the one two sound check explodes in white word fronts. If this were the event, would be waiting for the visuals. If this was the event, I'd wait for the answer. If this was the event, I would ask you to marry me. If this was the event, I'd be just about half crazy. In this event, there is a boy with three daisies here for the love of you. I'm going to finish um, by reading from my last full collection, The Restructure, and I'm going to read um, a poem called Kingfisher, just to finish up actually. And um, again, it, it was about being out in nature with, with my son when he was much younger. And um, I'd always wanted to see a kingfisher. I dreamt about seeing a kingfisher, but never actually got to see a kingfisher. Um, and I was with my wife, Sarah and Pavel. And Sarah saw the kingfisher, not one, but two. But I was tr trying to stop Pavel from jumping into a lake or something something like that, something two-year-olds do. I never actually saw the kingfisher. But I wrote this poem later in the day. And really, the poem is about you know could I, whether it would have been better to have seen the kingfisher or kept it alive in my imagination. And it starts with a quote from Charles Olson: "It's true, it does nest with the opening year, but not on the waters." How do you describe the blue you've never seen? I was fixing the biting muzzles of mitts to the boy's fingers. You saw the tailless hologram shoot its bib of awe. I was holding the boy from the lagoon green underbreeze of the lake. The blue flecks shook green its Atlantic dorsal. I was persuading the boy that faces in puddles were not the only ones to understand him. The savage Buddha ball bearing for digested fishbone. I was hauling the boy's knees from the altar of log pools. The blast of Bunsen made shrift its short fuel. I was kneading the yeast kisses he tossed to Canada geese, and azure lizard shed January skin. I was searching a path for the boy's alchemy of chance in gold grass, the pixelated dash from Victorian taxidermists. I was pushing the boy in euphorics towards the A roads of futurist fire services. The damsel blue hunter thrust its mollusk glance. I read that night. Only the righteous see the kingfisher. Hours later, the boy asleep, his consciousness given back to dreams, a gale to the wind chimes, his exhausted limbs lit by the trip switch of pulse. The righteous one said, as I drifted to dark, said the one word, kingfisher, and I caught his blue, pulled back from the only place I'd ever seen him. Thank you for having me, Robert, and thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Chris. That was that was really great. So our next reader is Andrew Philip. Andrew was born and raised on the east coast of Scotland and now lives near Edinburgh. His first collection, The Ambulance Box, was shortlisted for the Aldebra First Poetry Collection Prize, the Seamus Heaney Centre Prize for Poetry, and in the Scottish Book Awards. His newest collection is The North End of the Possible, and both of these were published by Salt. He's the poetry editor of Freight Books, a Scott language editor for Irish Pages, and a popular online teacher at the Poetry School. His website is andrewphillip.net, and it's great to welcome back Andrew to, to the reading series. Andrew, are you with us? I am. Good evening. Thanks very much for having me again. It's wonderful to be part of this. Um, and um, thanks uh, to Chris and Izzy for those wonderful, beautiful readings. Um, I'm going to read from uh, the North End of the Possible this evening. Uh, you can see the um, the poem that's in Silk Road appears in this book as well. So, um, but I'll get along to that one in a few minutes. First of all, I'm going to do a, a couple of poems that really concern. Um, language to a great extent, particularly um, the languages that we have in Scotland. The first one is called Look North and North Again. Um, 
one reference that's worth explaining, particularly for uh, those on the other side of, uh, of the Atlantic, is that Luke North is the Northern English um, regional news program. Um, and there are, there's quite a lot of Scots in this poem, but um, I'm not going to gloss it because it would take me too long, but you can find on my website a uh, comprehensive Scots glossary for the book, and there are links to that on the event page for this reading um, on Google+. So this is Look North and North Again. Since the result of the referendum on the future of Berwick-upon-Tweed, there have been increasing reports that adults in Northern England are spontaneously becoming Scottish. Doctors state that the condition does not seem infectious, but they are baffled by its rapid spread south and the fact that most patients show no previous connection to or even predilection for Bonnie Scotland the Brave. Can you listen to Hacker and Shaw? The Scottish Government is said to be working round the clock to isolate the cause so that the effect can be marketed to tourists. Court claims that the disease originated in a particularly braw herd of Aberdeen Angus immediately sent sales skyrocketing in North America. But Westminster has responded by scalping an export ban on all Scots food. Although number 10 is said to be sair fashed about the Queen's official banquet in Holyrood the morn, the palace brushed off contamination fears and revealed plans to welcome guests with the traditional old Ricky Hilson You'll have had your tea. So, from a poem about uh, about Scots to a poem that involves quite a bit of Gaelic, and the other indigenous language that we have here in Scotland. This, in fact, is something of an elegy for the great Gaelic poet um, Derek Thompson, or in Gaelic, Ruri Macomish, who died a couple of years ago. Um, the title is in Gaelic and means sun and blue. Um, the other thing I should say about the poem is that it incorporates a number of words and phrases from Thompson's poem, The Norseman Coming Ashore in Ness, Na Lochlan a Cheese in Nish. Um, I won't gloss all the Gaelic, um, but suffice to say that the sense is continuous with the English. Um, and uh, the final word of the poem is in Gaelic, kienalus. It means more or less homesickness. Grian iscorum. Whoever thinks this infinite lunch hour, its blazing sky sugared with cirrus, of where the great Gaelic poet is gone, Perhaps there will be echo aura, as with the Lochlanich, a chin a cheath, in his poem of another ground, as the thought rises of travelling. Cop erbanye bla na mara, sheen and town in the ears, and a green a jarsach, travelling. From the soul of the Atuchamafanus, the Alia Lia Gorum in Yorna, and the Gyanavich Gyal, travelling into a darkness we cannot fathom, where at last we may find dazzlement and the withering of all our kianalus. The next few poems concern the character Macadam, who appeared in my first collection, The Ambulance Box, but reappears in roughly half the poems in The North End of the Possible. And this next poem is, in fact, the piece that appeared in Silk Road. It's A Child's Garden of Physics, number one. 
uh, Macadam appears to have built something akin to the Large Hadron Collider in his garden shed in this book, in, in this poem. Um, he begins to tinker with it. Uh, there are a few Scots words and phrases in here that I will gloss. Trochled means more or less oppressed. Um, Monday in here isn't Monday the day, it's, uh, it's must do. Uh, Merck is a general Scots word for darkness. And queer like is just a Scots word for strange, peculiar. Thrang is busy or crowded. A child's garden of physics, number one. Trochled by the paraphernalia of a life spent tinkering. The long stands, the Monday hammers. Macadam settles to cobbling light apart into constituent darknesses. Pitmark, Pickmark. Part murk, heart murk. Even so, there's hardly enough murk in this world to account for the breadth of black he thinks must lie at the core of everything. And here it is, nestling in the pleasant land of counterfact, spreading as the sun droops the fundamental particle of night. It shades in, out of being, the way Macadam does when, not, when observ not observing himself at a distance, his anchor ego flowing through various queer-like states akin to the Nocton's flavours. Still, frang, change, dread, silent and sudden. The quirks the hour has flung at him gather in the corner of his shed. Now, armed with the tools to measure the murk aright, he can take to the streets to ascertain precisely what the afterlight is made of. This could be his service to us all. I will um, close with the next poem. Uh, as you might expect, when you start to mess around with the fundamental particle of night, things go awry for Macadam, and he ends up on the run, which is where we find him in this next poem, this last poem, Macadam Takes to the Sea. Unhooked from its tenter, the sea drifts off to arrive at a new understanding with the earth. While Macadam, wearied and clean out of Red Bull, walks to the edge of the land he's always called home. Pure force of habit, this locution. He has come to feel more at home on the move these days, on the move and in the dark. Aye, but there's dark, and dark the dawn has marvelled at. It's hidden from him yet, but Macadam must drive through such a gloom to witness how lightly the morning rises from its knees. Till then, we leave him wading waist deep into the loosened waves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. That was great. Always a pleasure. Uh, you couldn't hear me, but uh, at the beginning of your poem and also one of Chris's early poems, I found myself laughing out loud, <laughs> which is always uh, always a nice thing in, in poetry. So last but certainly not least, uh, we have Paul Stevenson. Paul Stevenson was born in Cambridge, but he now lives in Paris, where he's carrying out postdoctoral research. His poems have appeared in Poetry London, Magma, The North, The Wolf, Stan, Smith's Knoll, and Fourteen Magazine. He won the Magma Editor's Prize for poems of 
10 lines in length or fewer. And he was awarded a place in the prestigious German Arvid mentoring scheme last year. He's also a member of the Haggett Poets, which is where we first met. And so it gives me great pleasure to welcome Paul Stevenson. Hello, Robert. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you see me? We can hear you, but not see you yet. Is that okay? Can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Uh, for some reason, we can't see you. Are you have you um, turned on the video as well? Yes. Okay. It may it may come through in just a minute. Go ahead and go ahead and begin. Welcome, Paul. Okay, everybody. Um, I'm reading from Paris um, today, so I thought I'd begin with a poem that. Uh, brings you to France and is also quite seasonal. Sweep. Who sometimes sweeps the streets, sometimes doesn't. You can find him when the tramontane blows and October plane tree leaves tornado, past the mobile puppet show and doorstep range of children's rifles, beyond the dedicated benches sitting empty around the rhomboid square of the hunched back cats and the starlings raucous in the belfry. He's there every, every other Wednesday inside the bucket shop come bakery, behind the counter egg brushing pastry, spading high stacks of millefeuille into the rustle of brown paper bags. The second poem I'm going to read um, was made by feeding aircraft safety instructions through translation software um, to sort of play around with existing text and um, see what you would end up with uh, through various uh, versions of, of sending the text back and forth. Waistcoat of life. A waistcoat of life is necessary. Passengers are informed that under each seat, behind their feet, wrapped yellow, there lies an example to be inflated by gently drawing on a collapsing table. A waistcoat of life doubles up like a floating device, once calm but quickly put upon. Passengers are requested to buckle and tighten before sliding off potential. So listen hard, belt up, and fear the worst safety. Earlier in the year, there was quite some controversy in the United Kingdom about uh, corporation tax and multinationals avoiding corporation tax. And David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, suggested um, to certain businesses that they wake up and smell the coffee. Um, and this inspired a poem of mine. Wake up and smell the coffee. <coughs> smell the coughing, the cacophony, the cathard, the cavern. Wake up and smell kafafi, wake up and smell kefalonia, smell the keef, smell the kaftan, the kofte, the kifa, the okif. Wake up and smell the cufflink, wake up and smell the coffin. Sometimes you uh, are in the right place at the wrong time. Um, and this happened to me about three years ago uh, when I was um, in Istanbul. A fantastic city, uh, which I have been to physically, but didn't get to stay for very long. So this was the right place at the wrong time. Turkish delight. What you do when you get the call is take it. Hear pre-dawn words before they're mouthed. You should probably come now. What you do is shower and dress, skip coffee, yogurt and honey, buckle up a breakfast, Walk briskly to the ticket office, hand over your sob story. Once given a seat today, not tomorrow, because tomorrow is too late, what you do is pack. Sit on a shell-shocked suitcase, poring over a tourist map, mentally cataloguing Byzantine cathedrals, then mosques, until a 12-seater van for one pulls up to taxi you with stop-starts across the Bosphorus into Asia. 
what you do to kill an afternoon on a new continent at the international airport hub is brows, briefs and socks. Visit the James Joyce Irish pub, mill about getting sprayed with testers of musk, citrus and bergamot. Think nothing of spending 63 euros and 74 cents on different nut varieties of Turkish delights, which is heavy and must be carried. Register nobody you know likes Turkish delight, except him. What you do till they display your gait is stare out. Count the seconds between runway ascents. Promise you'll return one dusk to be consumed by the vastness of the Hagia Sophia. The pull. Moon is a dare. Arrayed on a haystack, a stock take of silver, a salver of harvest, a hay vest of gathered together field. The fold's reflection, the flock's reflex, the heart's flux, elected flicker. I'm going to read now the poem uh, from Silk Road Review, issue 10, in which there is a glossary um, of British terms, of British English terms, because there are quite a few um, terms in this poem which I think will be um, unfamiliar to uh, speakers outside the United Kingdom. So this poem is a, an exploration in, um, in a particular age. 15. 15's in between a colossize or giant step, unsure thing posing as a safe bet, explores all destinations without a route map, cover up as orange as easy jet. Fifteen covets a stickered shoebox, is a single mattress that pays no interest, a dump, engaged cubicles scratching top teams and crushes on the bog door and compass. Fifteen's a drag, pretends to inhale in the kingdom of the bus stop, Yawns tall enough to swallow double-deckers, thanks to impenetrable chambers and late-night joysticks. Fifteen's just missing it, being ferried about lockerless in white socks, carrying the back-breaking burden of biology and physics, necking snake-bite and black with fake ID flashes. Fifteen sports slip-ons, boycotts laces, rips velcro straps, is a hand-on-hip straggler with cross-country stitches, a job jog strap fielding wide enough to never catch it. Fifteen's a shiner, chewed pencil tie, everything resting on the extra half inch, may contain strong language and explicit lyrics, yeah, but sin, cos and tan are a total cinch. Fifteen's the lure of razors, rizzlers, cell block H, spiked, waxed, sun-inned, permed crew, leave it for long enough and it'll wash itself. Fifteen knows exactly what's been knocked off and where to get it. Kindly helps mum down off the shelf, too big for over your knee or a cuddle. Get off. Fifteen's whoever can piss highest, the relief at not having to go with them. Fifteen's out of here, you wouldn't understand. Fifteen's still a year to go. Um, when I was fifteen, I used to uh, receive music magazines weekly. Um, and perhaps it was all these uh, pop lyrics um, that um, gave me my interest in poetry, I suppose. Uh, these magazines were full of uh, sort of celebrity trivia and posters and lyrics. Um, and this poem um, is perhaps a sort of light-hearted uh, foray into the idea of uh, taking a piece of trivia, something really anodyne, and just traveling with it, seeing where it goes. Glass A. Fact is, there are no facts. But if there were, then once in an issue of Smash Hits I read, Madonna hates glass A cherries. You can imagine her predicament when it comes to cakes and cocktails and sometimes on top of trifles. She's wary of glass A, never blasé. Her doo-wop style pop shuffle and third single from Like a Prayer was called Cherish not cherries. The one where in the video she's writhing on the sand, ravished by the ocean. Don't ask me which ocean. The waves lapped and there was foam. Pacific? As for candied fruit generally, she can't see the point. But then nor can I if I can be candid. 
Once a year it comes in a hamper made of wicker you must sign for, which takes up space. Some jar of yellow and orange bits in syrup. I want to say topaz. Topaz. Bitter, inedible, mostly unopenable. But then Kylie Minogue dislikes thick sliced wholemeal hovis loaves. And I'm going to end with this poem, as I'm the uh, last poet in this virtual poetry magazine. Um, I thought I'd end with this. I've been a, uh, very interested in poetry magazines in the in the back pages, the actual notes on contributors um, of the different poem, poets and authors of magazines. And so this poem takes just those first few words of a number of um, uh, contributors' notes uh, to try to um, create some kind of poem. It's called Notes on Contributors, and this is my final poem. Thank you very much, Robert, for the opportunity to read, and thank you to everybody for listening. Notes on Contributors. Alison was born. Brian grew up. Chloe is a full-time. Dan devotes his spare. Eliza took part. Fabian has been a member. Jill divides her. Henry is completing. Isabel was a stand-up. Joel once sat on. Kirsten is currently, Lars was an inner city. Marion lives now, Nick is between, Olga was the first, Pablo continues to. Quinn co-founded, Robert launched, Saskia often gives, Todd recently received. Uma submitted, Victor used to. Wendy was highly, Xavier appears, Yolanda likes to, Zach will be. Thanks very much. Thank you, Paul. That was that was great. So, um, having concluded with our four poets, um, we're going to give away a copy of Silk Road Review issue ten to Grant Tarbard in Essex. And I realized that one of the great things about this format is also that as these words come sort of whizzing by uh, in, on first read, um, you have an opportunity with the archives to listen back, um, to savor moments that you enjoyed. Um, and to and to pick out favorite lines. So we're going to extend uh, the the giveaway um, until Tuesday the fifteenth. If you tweet a favorite line from uh, any of the poems read tonight using the hashtag TA Poetry, uh, you can enter and and have an opportunity to win an additional copy of Silk Road Review issue number ten. Speaking of which, our next. Uh, uh, reading for Silk Road Review will be Saturday, October 19th, with nearly twice as many poets as we had tonight. So more poets reading uh, shorter duration. Uh, that's happening at 8 p.m. here in the UK, 3 p.m. on the east coast of America, and noon on the west coast of America. Tune in and hear another uh, great range of voices reading their work live for your enjoyment. Finally, I just want to thank our our four excellent guests, Isabel Gallimore, Chris McCabe, uh, Andrew Phillip, and Paul Stevenson. If you liked what you heard tonight, of course, the best thing you can do is Google up the poets, seek out their work in journals. Uh, if they have books out, buy their books. And we'll see you back here uh, on Saturday the 19th for our next reading. See you then.